Hey, Internets. So recently there's been a lot of fluff going on about the Barbie movie being overly woke feminista garbage, and it seems to have revitalized the age-old YouTube traditions of criticizing feminist theory. Yep, welcome to earlier 2010s. Here we go again. Which isn't really that big of a surprise considering the problems of this movement never really went away. The fundamental issue with feminism is that it tells women that they need aggression to protect themselves from men, when in reality the opposite is true. Women, if anything, need men to protect them from aggression. And it is this colossally and irredeemably stupid error that effectively doomed feminism from the start. And by starting from this flawed epistemology that men are the bad guys and state intervention is needed to force my equity, it makes their entire ideology require authoritarianism to get anything done. Which is kind of ironic because when you think about it, you realize that that means that feminists are effectively the biggest simps for the patriarchy. Men with power are naturally better at executing aggression, and thus feminists are forced to vote for men to retain that power if they want their aggression-backed entitlements to continue. This obviously can never go anywhere, and it's why feminists will never actually get what they want, because their methods for trying to get what they want are inherently self-contradictory. But anyways, that brings up a question. How do we avoid the mistakes of past criticism of feminism? Well, that's what this video is going to be about. While I'm not going to mention any names here, I have already seen a few of those anti-feminist rants and takes in response to said bad Barbie movie that were, well, not so good and left quite a bit to be desired and also didn't really show that they understood what is really wrong with feminism. A lot of people, when they complain about feminism, they end up just kind of getting sucked into complaining about some specific women being cringe are going on this podcast saying that all women are tens or something. And then their entire video was just laughing at about how dumb and cringe she is. And it is true, that is a very dumb take for her to have, but it's not really the prime issue here. It's not the primary problem with the movement at its core. Those are more or less symptoms of the problem. Those are the bad outcomes of the problem, but they're not really the problem itself. So here's just some basic guidelines to follow and points that you should focus on when criticizing feminism. First off, and most importantly, anti-feminism should not, under any circumstances, be misogynistic, and it should in fact be the opposite. It should, if anything, be inclusive to women and emphasize why feminism is not giving the ladies what they want either. And yes, of course, I know, the woke toys are going to falsely accuse you of being a misogynist anyway when you're criticizing this movement. But that's all more the reason not to be misogynistic. That way you force them to have to dig and cherry pick through your posts and videos or whatever else you're putting out there so hard that they look like complete fools even to the normies. The more people who realize that the only real argument that the woke toys have is just false accusations of bigotry, the less effective those false accusations become. So being extra careful to ensure that you're not disparaging women in any way is extremely important. We are criticizing a highly flawed ideology here, not holding women collectively guilty for their miseducation that they have received as a result of that ideology. One very simple strategy to figure out how to include women in this criticism is to remember that men and women have to exist in a societal culture that allows them to get along in order for that society to continue. Therefore, it is extremely difficult to harm one sex in a way that doesn't have some kind of unintended negative consequence on the other sex. For instance, say you are making a point about relationships, and you point that one study, well actually there's more than one, but let's say you point to one of those studies that shows more and more young men aren't getting any like this one that was mentioned in the Washington Post in a general social survey. If you look at it, you will notice the percentage of women not getting any is also going up. Not quite as fast as men, but it is definitely going up as well. Well, let's look at this from a different perspective then. The number of women who are not married has also been going up over the years. They say men are the gatekeepers of commitment and women are the gatekeepers of sex. And the reality is that when either gatekeeps too hard, then neither gets what they want. Of course, feminists will try to cope and say that these women are choosing to stay out of bad marriages. But if that was true, we would be seeing a steep decrease in female depression, which is absolutely not the case. In fact, the opposite is true, and female depression and anxiety are both on the rise and are higher than they've been in ages. So this is clearly not working out very well for women either. But perhaps a simpler way to explain why harming men also hurts women and vice versa is to just look at the incentives that a lot of state-backed entitlements cause. Take, for example, the combination of alimony and no-fault divorce, for example. On the surface, this seems like a pretty sweet deal for women, right? If you don't like your husband for whatever reason, but you would miss the luxuries that he provides for you, you can just leave him. And you can have the state force him at gunpoint to keep providing resources to you. So very empowering. 
much wow. Except for one small problem. This highly incentivizes any man with a net worth at six figures or above to just not get married, especially when you look at the divorce rates. Men are faced with the question of whether or not they want to eat an apple from a basket where half of them are poisoned. This is why you see degenerate things like sugar daddy dating websites propping up more and more. Because a lot of these guys have figured out that it's less expensive to just temporarily date multiple cute college-age sugar babies than it is for them to risk a failed marriage. Remember those statistics I just mentioned about female depression and marriage rates and anxiety and all that, right? Gee, I wonder what could possibly be causing this. Could the social breakdown of the marriage contract have anything to do with it? Gee, man, I don't know. It's truly a mystery. This is why it is oh so incredibly stupid for feminists to not care about men's issues. Because men's issues eventually start to create issues for women. So if you care about women, you have to care about these things. That is the eternal tragedy of what you see in MRA and the manosphere. Is that a lot of what they are saying actually should be important to feminism if feminism was actually what it claims to be. But of course, feminism is not what it claims to be. And thus, here we are in 2023, still debating over the unresolved issues. But again, going back to what I'm trying to say here, this is also the reason why criticizing feminism need not be sexist towards women and should not be sexist towards women. TLDR anti-feminist content should put greater emphasis on how this isn't working out for the ladies either, and showing them how men's issues are also women's issues in the long run is a very simple way to show why giving women a bunch of state-backed entitlements and forced wealth transfer from men to women doesn't actually empower women in any meaningful way. Basically, anti-feminism needs to put greater emphasis on the fact that men's and women's issues are intrinsically linked and less making fun of specific women being cringe, as fun as that might be. My next recommendation for number two would be putting emphasis on the flawed arguments that feminists still make in 2023 and explain why they are flawed. For example, the wage gap. Yeah, in case you didn't notice, they're still making this flawed argument today. It has somehow stood the test of time despite being debunked over and over and over again. And to some degree, I've already gone over this. For those of you who don't know, I've already put out a video on the wage gap, which was basically a response to Unlearning Economics video on the wage gap, which showcases the main problem, which is that people who believe in the wage gap are completely ignoring incentives and qualitative analysis. To briefly summarize it, men and women do not actually have the same incentives when looking for what they want to get out of a relationship for the simple reason that women get pregnant and men do not. This means that if a woman wants to have a child, she has to find a man that is capable of taking care of her while she's pregnant. And if a man wants to have a child, he needs to be capable of taking care of a woman. And just this fact alone massively influences how men and women think in terms of career choice. And that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no state intervention needed there. And what the wage gap toys will do is they will look at that gap and then they claim that women have less access to resources. But that is a fallacy. Earning less is not the same thing as having less. If you earn less, but you're being provided for by your family members, then you don't actually have less, do you? For instance, if we were to compare a rich man who inherited $100 million and just sits in his basement and plays video games all day, to a poor, impoverished man who earns minimum wage, if we were to apply this reasoning, we would be forced to assume that the impoverished man actually has more access to resources because he's earning more than the guy who just inherited everything. When it's put like that, it becomes obvious just how incredibly stupid this reasoning is, but unfortunately, this is the reasoning that feminists use when defending the wage gap. Or a simpler way to put it is to just point out how feminism has created this unholy alliance with far-left economics. In fact, a lot of times you don't even really need to talk about feminism in order to refute modern feminism. If you just sit there and refute a lot of leftist economic talking points, you are by proxy refuting feminism. I mean, I can basically just sit here and talk strictly economics, such as the negative effects of state regulations imposing static costs, or I could talk about the welfare trap, or talk about praxeology or talk about how market incentives work or how they tie into career choices. And I would be creating effective arguments against feminism without even talking about feminism. This is just a base result of the fact that modern feminism has this alliance with neo-Marxism. They are standing so close to each other that you can often just roast Marxism, and feminism is in the proximity to get roasted along with it. For instance, say a feminist spews some generic talking point, leading into the statement, and this is why we need more government programs. Well, here's the beauty of it. You don't actually need to address the feminist talking points if you don't want to. You can instead just point out why said government programs are wasteful and ineffective, and then just move on with your day. So oftentimes you don't even need to talk about feminism or roast it, you can just roast bad economic policy. Heck, you might not even need to think about feminism, you might not even need to care. 
So I'll just move on to number three, focus more on the alliance of wokeism and feminism and its cult-like cultural obsessions. This in particular is very easy to do in conjunction with my first suggestion, which is including women more in criticism of feminism. Because as it turns out, a lot of the woke-toid forced representations of women in media, especially in the West lately, have actually been pretty darn sexist. Because feminism encourages this sort of fake female empowerment from this false premise that femininity is somehow a weakness, and in order to achieve true equality with men, women must cast aside their femininity and uh, become what it was previously considered to be more masculine. But this is obviously nonsense, and it's pretty easy to see why it's nonsense by a very simple example, the game I'm playing for this rant. At no point in the game is woo Miriam is strong whammon shoved in your face. So at no point does she ever come across as a forced representation character. And her character design shows that you don't need to cast aside femininity to have a woman who is still very capable. But of course Bloodstained was made by Koji Igarashi and woke trash has been significantly less prevalent in Japan. So how does this compare to some western empowered female characters? Well it brings up with it this idea that you need to design the women to be intentionally ugly and very masculine otherwise they aren't a proper representation of more marginalized body types or whatever the current backbat spin is. And that's incredibly stupid and sexist. Women don't need to cast aside being cute and feminine in order to be badass. And this brings up a particular false dichotomy that often comes up with feminist whining. They will often try to claim that an attractive character counts as objectification, but that doesn't make any sense now, does it? Because finding someone attractive doesn't require you to objectify them. You can absolutely respect a person's strength, intelligence, personality, and everything else good about them while also noticing that they're attractive. It's just another aspect of a character. It doesn't mean you have to view them as an object. And if you look back on things, this is a really common false dichotomy that they've been throwing around for a very long time too. So that's another reasoning error in feminist theory that should be called out more often. And as a side note, the major problem with representation characters in general is that they're always a Mary Sue. I'd recommend looking into Literature Devil's work if you want to see why this is, but the TLDR of it is that when you make a representation character, you are effectively creating a character who exists purely as a self-insert power fantasy. And when it's combined with social justice, it becomes a power fantasy that is designed to push some kind of political bias. And that actually makes the character character less empowering, because nobody who is smart enough to notice the grift is going to take these characters seriously. It's bad, predictable, fan fiction tier writing. And so ironically, by not trying to cater to these easily offended feminist sensibilities, you actually end up with a more interesting female character. And of course you do. She's not shackled by some weird need to be politically correct and thus she is allowed to grow as a person in her own story in a way that makes sense, rather than a way that is designed to push some illogical political bias. Wow, it's almost like people who are just trying to write a good story write better stories than people who are just trying to push a certain in-real-life narrative. And then, of course, when these people try to write male characters, they make them intentionally weak or incompetent, which is really just an inverted Mary Sue. And the fact is, normal everyday people are actually getting pretty tired of this, so it's a relatively easy thing to focus on that people can relate to. Now the last point I want to go over is in regards to the Manosphere. Be careful when treading the Red Pill community, the Pickup Artist community, MGTOW, or any other factions of what you would call the Manosphere, because they are largely a mixed bag of good information and also some bad information. Now luckily there's a pretty easy way to tell if something you are reading from these communities is genuine or nonsense, and that is to look at it and honestly ask yourself, is what they are saying sound like it is coming from a place of genuine experience, or does it sound like it's coming from a place of spite? Because if it's spite, then that means it's more emotional than reason-based, and it might not really benefit you very much to pay it any attention. Another thing to be aware of is that some of them have a tendency to mix genuine red pills with questionable solutions. A good example of this is Andrew Tate. A lot of what Andrew Tate says, at least on its surface, is completely true. For instance, the fact that men are born without any inherent value and that we have to essentially build our own value is completely accurate. The world absolutely does not give a single solitary crap about your average man unless he has something to provide it. The liberal world has been unfair to men. That is is also true, and feminism has largely been sold to the West as a false cure. Therefore, men have to build and better themselves. You should be lifting and caring about your health. You should be spending time on your hygiene and how do you socially carry yourself. You should be working towards a real career, and working harder is never going to not help, for the most part at least. If you let yourself burn out, then it's going to be even worse. But working harder within your reasonable ability to do so and handle yourself, yeah, that's never going to not help. Because the reality is, yes, you have to pick yourself up, because no one in this world is going to do it for you. Life is not fair, and young men in the West have indeed been born in a time where misandry is socially acceptable. Oh well, tough cookies, that sucks. But it's better to find ways to win at life anyways, rather than just whine about it. 
All of these things are true, and when Andrew Tate talks like this, he is, for the most part, correct. The problem comes with what he tries to sell you next. For instance, he's basically suggesting male degeneracy as a response to female degeneracy, kind of like a big middle finger to our messed up world. This is an issue because you absolutely can push this hyper-competitive dog-eat-dog mindset to the point where it becomes toxic, where you are constantly judging yourself and others for things that honestly do not really matter. This kind of hyper-materialistic mindset, like for instance, expensive sports cars. Do you want to know what will make you happier than getting one of those things? Not giving a hoot, that's what. The truth is you don't actually need to be that rich to make it. You just have to be comfortable with yourself and what you have. If you have two men who both own a boring old generic 2005 Honda Civic, basically the most basic car you can get, and one is extremely self-conscious and embarrassed about it and is constantly comparing himself to that guy who owns a hundred Lamborghinis, while the other guy doesn't give a crap and just sees his car as a way to get from A to B, well guess which one of these men is going to have a more successful dating life? The answer is the man who doesn't care, because the truth is that women go Go out with men who are short and poor all the time. Rather, it is the insecurity that tends to turn them away. So you don't actually need to try and clone Tate to enjoy life. And some people will actually be worse off if they attempt to do so. This is why I would recommend listening to someone like Aaron Clary instead if you are looking for actual, decent manosphere takes on feminism and life advice and whatnot. His takes are far smarter and much more directly to the point, but most importantly, he isn't trying to shovel any of that Hustler's University stuff. And he isn't trying to get you to buy anything that you either A. can't afford, or B. don't need to be buying in the first place. Anyways, I'll wrap this up with a quick summary. Anti-feminism does not and should not equal anti-woman. We should instead be showing how feminism is a bad deal for women as well. So try to avoid the whole boys versus girls thing. This comes with the added benefit of making it even easier for us to laugh at the woke scolds when their only argument is just false accusations of sexism and bigotry. And next, things like the wage gap and other victimhood arguments, along with their ineffective status solutions, can often be refuted by just refuting leftist economic takes in general. Also, cultural critique is a winning argument because the centrists, and to be honest, even some of the center-left liberals, are getting tired of it too. And lastly, check Aaron Clary out if you want good quality and, most importantly, practical manosphere-type life advice. Also, this probably won't be my last video on the topic, but for now, that's all. So thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, share, leave a comment, tip my ko-fi, subscribe, and of course, follow me on Twitter for my hot takes and random updates, or X, I guess, it is what, it's what Elon Musk decides to, decided to call it now, even though the URL is still Twitter. Yeah, till next time.